Good morning, church family. We're going to be continuing our series in Acts, so turn with me to Acts 12, or 13, 1 through 12. And this can be found on page 921 of your pew Bibles. Now in seminary, we had a required reading in our preaching class by Brian Chapel, And he wrote in his book, and I quote, New preachers should avoid jumping into a sermon series such as Acts. And here we are, new preacher, Acts sermon series, which simply means we are now totally reliant on the Holy Spirit in which we should be. So previously we had heard in chapter 11 that Barnabas went and found Saul and brought him back to Antioch. Now Antioch was a hub of sorts. It was a rapidly growing Gentile church. And for an entire year, Barnabas and Paul were with the church in Antioch and teaching the congregation. So the latter half of chapter 11 is the church of Antioch being established by the Lord through its members, which lands us in our text where it starts with a list of names of important men in the early church. Today we will see how the Spirit flows through the church in calling all peoples. And out of those peoples, the Spirit ordains leaders. And then the text narrows into a, we'll call, confrontation with those leaders in the world around them. So therefore, our three points will be, the Spirit includes all peoples. The Spirit ordains leaders out of those peoples. And through the Spirit, God's Word is proclaimed. So let us now turn to God's Word and His revelation, starting with these list of names, of these members in the early church. Acts 13, 1 through 12, hear God's word. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to the Lord for, for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You, son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he had saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Here ends the word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Father God, we are broken vessels in need of your word. We ask that your spirit fill those vessels so that we could receive the washing of your word, that we could grow closer to you. And Lord, let the Spirit open our hearts and open our ears to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the Spirit includes all peoples. As we opened up in chapter 13, we see the church, it has been established. There were prophets and teachers leading a congregation, giving the word of the Lord. And in this verse, we're given a list of names, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean, and Saul. 
With some of these names, we get an account of cultural, racial, and political background. Simeon, who was called Niger, this is a Latin term for black. Simeon was an African. His skin color was different from those of the Hellenistic background, which composed a large portion of the church of Antioch. We see this in chapter 11, verse 20, where missionaries fleeing persecution preached the gospel, and the Lord's hand was with them, bringing over many Hellenists. Hellenists were typically natives in an area who had adopted the Greek culture. While Hellenists is a culture and not a race, we can be confident in saying Simeon, dark in complexion, was a minority by far. And Simeon is listed here amongst prophets and teachers next to Apostle Paul. He is held high amongst his Christian brothers. The Holy Spirit not only listed his name amongst the forefathers of the faith, but told us his ethnicity, told us his church would be diverse and full of all cultures. Now, I remember I was watching a, I think it was a, like an MSNBC special where this anchor was following these Christians who were on a holy trek. They were going to a holy site to worship the Lord. And the anchor was condescending and talking loud as if his loud talking would break the language barrier. Um, he made it apparent he wasn't a believer and was pushing an agenda to make us Christians seem archaic. As the interview went on, I felt myself getting angry. I kept thinking to myself, why don't you just leave this guy alone? He doesn't care what you're doing here. Why do you care what he's doing here? And this was apparent that the Christian wanted no parts of this interview as they continued to interview basically the back of his head. So they're following him with his microphone. He's on his holy track, and he's like answering but not really answering. Now, here was a guy, for all intents and purposes, was totally different than myself. We didn't speak the same language. We don't share the same culture. We don't share any luxuries. We don't eat the same food. We had different hobbies. He was wearing sandals, and I typically wear Crocs. <laughs> to, the, to the world, we had nothing in common, absolutely nothing. And interviewing him was a man of the same skin color. He spoke the same language, ate the same food, went to a similar school, grew up in the same country, pledged allegiance to the same flag, and probably had some of the same hobbies. But friends, the reporter and I were worlds apart. The Christian and myself, no matter how different our worldly cultures were, we had everything in common. Our hearts were for the Lord. A conversation with the Aramaic man even though our theologies are probably a little different, would end up in prayer together in unison to the one true God. While a conversation with the reporter would most likely end in prayer by myself, praying that this man would hear the gospel call. Now, true unity is only found in Christ. We put our hope in Jesus the same way Christians do in China, the same way they do in Germany, the same way they do in Africa, Guatemala, Russia, Japan, across the globe. And this makes them all brothers and sisters of ours. We are one body. So the Spirit includes all races. The Spirit includes all peoples. Now our next name in the list with an interesting description is Menaean. Attached to it is not a great resume. He was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, what we call in the ministry, not a good look. When we read Acts 13, we assume Herod Tetrarch is the same Herod at the end of 12. He is struck by the Lord in verses 20 to 25, but this isn't the same Herod. Now, as we learned last week from Pastor Seth and from God's Word, there are many Herods, and they're all notoriously bad guys. But when you attach Herod to the Tetrarch, it's a very specific bad guy. And that probably didn't clear it up very well for you, but that was Herod Antipas. This is the Herod who married his brother's wife, who was also his niece. 
This is the Herod who, through his own lust, was responsible for the beheading of John the Baptist. The same Herod Jesus gave silence to before he was crucified. This Herod, this guy, this is Manaean's lifelong friend. Manaean, before being made a new creation in Christ, before he was given the Holy Spirit, was an unsavory character with unsavory friends. And who knows, he may have even had a tattoo on his neck. This speaks volumes to who Christ has called to his church. We have Saul, who was a student of the law, religious in background, who persecuted in the name of religion. And Manaean, a lifelong friend, an associate of one of the worst tetrarchs, who we could say represented evil. These are two different enemies to Christianity for totally different reasons, yet both made alive in Christ. They were made alive in Christ. And they were listed by name as men of importance in the early church. And friends, do you know someone who is wicked and think to yourselves, I can't wait for judgment. I can't wait for them to get what they deserve. Do you guard yourself against a certain wickedness or a certain people's because you feel that they won't hear the gospel? Have you written off someone because deep down you don't believe they will hear the gospel call? But God's word tells us Jesus came for the sick and not the healthy. His spirit transcends our cultural differences. His spirit transcends the condition of our heart and makes the wicked a new creation. Christ uses our diversity. He uses our experiences, who we were and who we are becoming as gifts to his church. What Christian doesn't love a good redemption story? A story of God taking brokenness and making it whole. I know I do. I'm a product of it, and so are you. So out of these broken peoples, who Christ has made whole, the Spirit, through his church, ordains leaders. So you have the group of people the Spirit calls, and then it ordains leaders. And while they, the church, were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke to them, set apart Barnabas and Paul for the work the Lord has called them to. For us in the church today, wouldn't it be so easy to hear that audible voice do this? Should I take this job, or should I marry this person, or should I become a member of this church, or should I make this investment, or should I, should I, should I? In our liturgy today, we poorly responded to the Westminster Confessions of Faith 1-6, and although not as authoritative as Scripture, it gives us great clarity. Let me read it. The whole counsel of God concerning all things for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in his word. In layman's terms, in all things pertaining to life, faith and salvation is in his word. His word answers the should eyes in our lives through the spirit in us interacting with his written word. So as we read God's word, we grow in wisdom. We as his Covenant people can make godly decisions for our lives. And as for today, as we ordain ministers, there is scripture that tells us how these men should conduct their lives as spiritual leaders. That's how the Spirit speaks to the church today, by illumination through his word. And friends, you have been faithful in this for years. You have been raising leaders to fulfill their calling from the Lord you have two in seminary right now, and someday, Lord willing, elders will put their hands on these men and send them out to the ministry. And look at verse 5. When they arrived to their destination, what did they do? 
they proclaimed the word of God. The Spirit had called them. The church, recognizing the calling, ordains them and then sends them off. And they proclaim the gospel in the world. MCC, you've been a part of this process a few times now. This is a sign of a healthy church. You have been faithful to his word. We have now seen how the Spirit gathers a diverse group of peoples. And out of those peoples, the Spirit ordains men for the ministry. And these men, through the Spirit's Through the Spirit, God's Word is proclaimed. Through the Spirit, God's Word is proclaimed. We are then introduced to Bar Jesus, which is Aramaic for the Son of Jesus. And in verse 8, we get his name, Elimus, which means magician, or more fitting, corrupter. Then the text quickly turns to Sergius Paulus. We're going to go through a little history lesson real quick, so try not to fall asleep. Now, Sergius Paulus was a proconsul, and in Roman government, as they conquered territories, they would divide them into two camps, imperial and senatorial. The peaceful areas that required very little military force were senatorial, and a proconsul was appointed by votes of the Senate. The territories that needed military force such as Jerusalem, they were appointed a procurator by the emperor. The imperial provinces ruled with more of an iron fist and a military might, while the senatorial territories were given to proconsul, which delved more into civil matters and peaceable means. That being said, it's no wonder this proconsul is a man of intelligence. His calling was peace through civil means, not peace through force. When we think of procurator, we can think of Pontius Pilate. Um, but anyways, the proconsul summoned Paul and Barnabas, and look what it says in verse 7. It says that the proconsul sought to hear the word of God. And isn't that how the Spirit works? There's an interest or a drawing to the word of God, whether it read or preached. And Sergius was certainly drawn. He sought to hear it. However, there were two parties giving a gospel to Sergius Paulus, two contrasting gospels. There was Bar-Jesus, the false prophet, who was giving a worldly gospel. We can't be entirely sure of what he was saying to the proconsul, but we get some hints from his title, false prophet. Dr. R.C. Sproul, when speaking of false prophets, wrote, the greatest threat to God's people is the false prophet. And under the new covenant, we must guard against those who twist Scripture. It's clear by definition, this Jewish false prophet was twisting Scripture, trying to convince Sergius Paulus of his own doctrine. But Paul, filled with the Spirit, addresses this false teaching. Paul doesn't call him son of Jesus like he said his name was. Paul calls him the son of the devil. Paul tells him he's making crooked the straight path to the Lord. And that straight path is faith in Jesus Christ. So this false prophet, by twisting scripture, he was spreading a false gospel, a worldly gospel, a gospel with an empty promise. And friends, there are many teachers in many churches around the world who preach the same empty gospel. They twist scripture to fit their own desires or to fit the culture around them. They do not hold to scripture as thus says the Lord. All scripture is breathed out by God. Thus says the Lord. A marriage is between one man and one woman. Thus says the Lord. Practicing any form of sexuality, including the desire of, outside of marriage, is sin. Thus says the Lord. Preaching and teaching in the church is an office reserved for men. Thus says the Lord. And the only way to the Father is through Jesus. Thus says the Lord. Now notice how these are hot topics in today's world. They're hot topics in the churches around us. When a church or congregation starts to water down his word, 
start to deny its weightiness, saying things like, oh, well, that was the culture of the time. Or God is love, so he's okay with homosexuality. He's okay with you changing your gender. When a church twists God's word, the straight path gets abandoned. It. And before you know it, it's crooked. And then it's no path at all. So Paul, filled with the Spirit, rebukes this false prophet, and the hand of the Lord blinds him. And look at verse 11. You will be blind and unable to see the sun for some time. Now that leaves us with hope. There is still hope. There is hope for those who say they know Jesus but are lost on a crooked path. They may be blind to the gospel now, but this condition isn't necessarily forever. So preach the gospel and give his word unbridled. Give the hard truths as thus says the Lord. The Spirit through his word will convict those who are blind and call others to himself. And look at the beauty in verse 12. Then the proconsul believed, and he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He wasn't astonished by Paul's teaching. He was astonished by thus says the Lord. Congregation, are there times in your walk where someone says something about God that just simply isn't true? Are there times where you let liberal theology slide in the name of unity? Are there times where you've had a hard truth for someone from Scripture, but you're afraid of confrontation? Well, the battle lines have been drawn, and there is no neutrality. There's thus says the Lord, and thus says mankind. But be encouraged. It wasn't Paul's teaching, it was the Lord's. Be encouraged that the gospel works on the hearts of men, not you. If salvation was left up to our ability to articulate it well, no one would be saved at all. So as Paul and Barnabas went out to preach the gospel, you too can proclaim the good news. This good news is from his word by his spirit. This good news is salvation. Salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. In congregation, You've been called here by the creator of the heavens and earth, just as the early church was in Antioch. You have raised leaders from amongst you to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And these leaders, they are in pulpits as mouthpieces for the Lord, saying, thus says the Lord. And this is the beauty of the Spirit's work through God's church. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the diversity of your church and the gifts that each person brings to your body. And we also pray for more leaders to be raised up to proclaim the gospel in the world. We give thanks for this work. And we give thanks for your work in us and through us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us continue our worship in praise.